Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Sebelius, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and pleased to be here today with my colleague, uh, Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture. And we just came from an event with Vice President Joe Biden to announce that the uh, Food Safety Working Group created by President Obama in mid-March has come back with a series of important rec recommendations to make our food safety system infinitely better in the 21st century to try and prevent illnesses before they happen, to have better data, better tracking, and to stop uh, the outbreak of uh, food illnesses, foodborne illnesses, which unfortunately kill about 5,000 Americans each year, hospitalize hundreds of thousands of people, and cause millions and millions of dollars worth of damage to our important uh, food market in America. Well, Kathleen, I want to thank you for uh, the partnership we've had with uh, the Health and Human Services and the Department of Agriculture. Uh, President Obama charged both of our, our, our departments with working together in an integrated way to come up with a set of core principles. And it is important for all of you to know that those core principles really are about keeping you and your families safe. Uh, we obviously want to prevent foodborne illness from occurring. Uh, if it does in fact occur, we want to be able to respond quickly uh, to any incident to be able to reduce the number of people who might be exposed. And then we want to learn from those experiences and make sure that our system continues to improve. Our work in the working group is not done. We're going to continue to work uh, as department uh, together to, to continue to look for ways to improve uh, food safety. We announced several steps today. Uh, uh, in our department, we're going to strengthen rules uh, in terms of salmonella and poultry. and try to do a better job of making sure we detect E. coli in, in uh, ground beef uh, in particular. But there's a lot more work to be done and actually you all can be helpful to us uh, to encourage members of Congress to continue focusing on food safety. Uh, so we look forward to the conversation. Great. Well, Secretaries, we have a really good discussion going on right here. Um, Jason Tetro earlier on in the discussion uh, talked a little bit about the fact that 40 percent of all consumers believe that they play no role in food safety. I know that's an important part of what you talked about today. Well, it's true. Uh, they, I think consumers can be um, part of the detection system uh, to make sure that we track outbreaks very quickly. If uh, someone in uh, your family falls ill after eating a meal, uh, transmitting that evidence to the local health department is, is a big, important first step uh, so that we can be rapidly responding to uh, what may be a foodborne illness. It, it could be the flu, it could be uh, some other illness that has nothing to do with the food, but if it, if it appears to be something related to uh, the food and illnesses caused, having that step, certainly keeping track of, of the warnings being put out. Um, there is a uh, important websites that the CDC and, and the Food Safety Working Group are going to uh, continue to post uh, to make sure that consumers share information with one another and we stop people from purchasing what may be contaminated products and then learning more about um, what is and is not safe for you and your family is I think an important way that we can all take some personal responsibility and be in this together. Consumers also have a responsibility to know how best to prepare and to maintain that's food right. uh, to limit and reduce the risk. And that's one of the reasons why both the uh, Health and Human Service website and the USDA website are good places for information about proper handling and proper response. The food safety website that uh, Secretary Sebelius talked about is a fairly easy one to remember, www.foodsafety.gov. Uh, tremendous opportunity for us to reach out to you as a consumer uh, to let you know if there's a problem, to give you information, to, to allow us to do a better job of alerting you more quickly. We'll also be working perhaps a bit more closely than we have in the past with our state public health uh, uh, partners right. and our local government uh, partners uh, to make sure that we broadcast messages concerning recalls uh, as quickly as we possibly can. That's great. Um, there's a great co conversation happening right now about um, getting more people farming in this country, Secretary Vilsack. Um, <laughs> Danny Howick from D.C. would like to see a government-sponsored program to encourage young people to farm. I know that's something you've worked on a lot. Well, uh, fortunately, we have a first family that's committed to this as well. Uh, the First Lady's uh, garden uh, at the White House and our garden at uh, the People's Garden at USDA has encouraged a lot of folks to get into the gardening business. 
and we're seeing a substantial increase in, in local gardening, community-supported agriculture. We've started a program at uh, USDA called Know Your Food, Know Your Farmer. It's really designed to link local production and local consumption, and we will be having uh, a good deal of discussion about how we can encourage young people in particular to get started. We also have a beginning farmer program uh, to provide the capital to allow farmers to get started. One interesting fact that people might take, uh, might find interesting, that in the last five years, there were 108,000 new farming operations started in America in the category of farms with less than $10,000 in sales. These are obviously not big operations, but 108,000 entrepreneurial opportunities uh, repopulating rural America, we obviously want to see an expansion of those kinds of opportunities. And as you know, um, Tom Vilsack is the former governor of Iowa, and I am the former governor of Kansas, and we take farming and food safety very <laughs> seriously true. because we both come out of the heartland where a lot of the food consumed in this country is grown and processed. So uh, these are near and dear to our hearts. There's a Along those same lines, there's a nice discussion and a bunch of questions coming up from Eric Burkhardt and then Jennifer Owens talking about if organic and natural food are the healthiest option, then why aren't they mandated more often? We have a system where only the richest can afford organic pro produce. Jennifer talks about a food justice issue and there's some more questions about how do we get healthy, safe food into inner cities and some communities where people can't afford it. Well, you know what's interesting about this is that uh, it doesn't necessarily have to cost more. Uh, I think that there is the belief that it does cost more, but uh, the reality is that uh, there have been some studies done by USDA that show that you can still eat you know, very, very healthy food uh, at, at a relatively inexpensive cost if you know how to prepare it and how to maximize it. Again, the USDA web website's got uh, opportunities uh, for folks to learn more about that. Uh, there is the issue, and I'll just mention this briefly, uh, Kathleen, there's the issue of food deserts in urban centers. Right. Right. And we are trying to address that. Uh, we've got uh, some of the leading grocers in the country now focused on this issue, trying to figure out how can we actually get uh, grocery stores to establish themselves in urban centers when fast food restaurants and convenience stores uh, prosper quite well in these, uh, these same neighborhoods. So there ought to be a way uh, for us to get uh, these food deserts uh, 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 get uh, good food to folks in, in all parts of the country. And I think Tom is right, not only the, the grocery store issue, but there's a lot of work going on about how we uh, have healthier food in school cafeterias and how we make sure that local um, farmers and growers are actually able to be vendors in, in local establishments, nursing homes and hospitals and schools, uh, which often have mass purchasing uh, contracts that drive produce uh, for miles away. So a lot of that work is underway as we look at the health and nutrition of uh, not only the current generation, but uh, our children uh, having an opportunity to have healthier food at every step along the way is really a critical piece of the challenge to help reduce the levels of obesity that we see, encourage healthier eating, and actually introduce fruits and vegetables at a much earlier stage to our children. And ketchup is not a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because Kat Bithsmith just brought that up. She says, what do we do to get people to, eat, to, that people overeat right now? What can we do to encourage people to not overeat and do more exercise? Well, well one of the things we can do is uh, Sesame Street and a number of uh, preschool uh, and child care uh, facilities are beginning to encourage young parents to know a little bit more about the nutritional value of food uh, and the nutritional density of food. Uh, a calorie isn't the same as every other calorie. There are some calories that have more nutritious uh, density than others. Uh, and so as young parents learn more about nutrition, they can do a better job of educating their youngsters about it. And if we uh, figure out strategies for encouraging youngsters to be consumers of fruits and vegetables and then making them available, as Kathleen suggested, in school lunch programs, school breakfast programs, after, after school snack programs, which, by the way, this is an important year for all who are watching this. We will be reauthorizing a lot of the child nutrition uh, laws this year. Right. And this is a tremendous opportunity for you to be engaged in this debate, to encourage your members of Congress, your senators, to provide the resources that will allow us to expand access to these programs and improve the quality of them. And a new train is starting up on food safety research. Betsy Bourne from DC says, food safety research is needed, yet not funding for it not yet funding for it continues to be cut from budgets. I want to know if the group that you two are working on will support and recommend more food safety and food science research at universities. 
Well, I think there's definitely an effort underway that is um, both in the um, collection, um, not only the research, but collection of data that is part of the strong recommendations coming out of the Food Safety Working Group. I know that the National Institutes of Health have funded a number of um, projects based on uh, information dealing with nutritional value in uh, the work we can do on food. And also the Centers for Disease Control is uh, very committed to this area. So I think there are multiple efforts. The bill that Congress is considering right now uh, dealing with food safety initiatives also is prom promoting extensive investments in research to make sure that we uh, prevention is all about knowing what's coming next and understanding what the potential harms are that face us. So the more research we do, the better we collect that data, the faster we analyze it, I think the safer our food supply will be because it's coming from all over the world. You know, the Vice President mentioned earlier today that the food safety system hasn't really kept up with the times. Uh, and as we look on a prevention focus, that means we're going to have to know more about pathogens. And to know more about pathogens, you obviously have to have up-to-date research. So that's a valid point. And along those lines, Nancy Kaplan said, I'm wondering if you, how you plan to address the need for better traceability of foods from the farm to the supermarket. What role will technology, like sensors and barcodes, play in, in this sort of stuff that you've been talking about today? Well, I think there's no question that um, what we need is a 21st century system. Uh, and um, as Tom has already said, the vice president said we haven't been updated very much since Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle in 1906. So we have uh, some distance to catch up. But uh, technology uh, is helpful, and government can do some of the inspections. But what we need is a much more integrated system where uh, the importers and uh, marketers and producers are taking some responsibility that we really have a collaborative public-private effort uh, to make sure that we trace and track the food because we now have an international food supply um, of fruits and vegetables, of fish, of meat coming from all over the world and the likelihood that we can inspect each and every product as it comes through our um, borders is not really very uh, valid, but what we can have is a much better system of, of understanding where the food products came from, involving the private industry uh, as a collaborative partner in identifying any initiatives that may happen, given stronger powers to our inspectors to stop and, and hold food if there's a suspected contamination outbreak and, and quickly get that word out. And the reason why the marketplace should be interested in that system is that if we're able to trace back, then we're able to be very specific about where the problem was, right. which means that the entire market doesn't get jeopardized and, and, com and complicated and, and compromised. Uh, we saw with just one cow, for example, the beef industry was devastated uh, several years ago and still has never recovered in terms of trade opportunities. So it is important for the industry and for the market, in addition for the health, right. to be able to pinpoint precisely and as accurately and as quickly as possible where the problem is. A new chain starting with, with comments from Northern Indiana and Bowling Green, Kentucky, is worried about um, a one-size-fits-all approach to food safety regulation. Amy says, are there efforts to understand that one-size-fits-all fits all doesn't work for small-scale meat processors? And Mike says, how are these changes, Mike Petroselli in Indiana says, how do these changes in regulations apply to smaller growers and retailers, the people on the roadside stand? Well, one of the, the, the aspects of a prevention uh, approach is to really focus on a risk uh, assessment. Where is the greatest risk lie and how do you respond to that, to that great risk? And so as a result of that, there, there obviously will be distinctions between various facilities based on, and various products based on the level of risk that's associated and involved. So that is one response. And the second response is as we create more local production and local consumption opportunities, we need, it will be challenging for us to figure out precisely how we do work a system that ensures safety and ensures uh, enough of a market uh, for folks to, to, uh, to be profitable. I think we can work on that and, and I, think we're gonna, I think we'll be successful at it. Well, I think in addition, the partnerships that we've already talked about with um, private industry 
We also need very robust partnerships with local health departments mm -hmm. and um, local initiatives. Some of the meat inspection, for instance, is done at the local level by the local agriculture department. Depending on how um, robust the marketplace is, there are responsibilities that don't rest with the federal government, they rest with our state and local partners. So that's another piece of this puzzle to have a really integrated, transparent system, same rules, rapid response, and rapid sharing of that information. Um, we have time for just one more question, and a great one came in from Kansas City, Missouri, from Jonathan Morris. Why does the federal government, uh, why, why, why is it important for the federal government to do something about domestic food safety? Um, why can't states just do it? Well, I think, um, Jonathan, uh, it, it's critical that um, whether it's the Food and Drug Administration with the responsibility of overseeing uh, a lot of the food products or the Department of Agriculture, which has the responsibility over a lot of the meat products, that we have a, a system in place that ensures safety to the American public. 5,000 people a year die from foodborne illnesses in this country. Uh, millions are hospitalized. Uh, so it's a safety and security of the American people is the president's primary objective. And certainly, uh, you shouldn't have to wonder when you serve your kids dinner whether or not what you're serving them uh, may harm them in the long run. So that's really a responsibility that we take seriously in conjunction with our state and local partners. And I think it's important for consistency that there be uh, a set of rules that everybody understands. Because you have processors that are shipping uh, food products in all 50 states, you have countries all bringing- all over the world. All over the world. Uh, you have countries bringing food products into the United States. So naturally, uh, not every state can do things at the border uh, like the federal government can. So there are important roles for every level of government. What has been lacking has been a integration of those, of those responsibilities and better communication. The, the working group uh, that uh, Kathleen and I chaired has essentially suggested we need to do a better job of integration, and, and that's what we're committed to doing. And just to make it clear, this isn't a new role for the federal government to play. This is not a you know, new responsibility or the federal government taking over things. It's really an update of the system that's been in place uh, for a long time, uh, an updated role, but recognizing that uh, we have a very different market than we did when the original food safety rules were put in place. We have an international market, and we need a very different response system and prevention system, and that's what the Food Safety Working Group was charged with. What does our 21st century food safety system look like? And that's the work that we're collaborating on today. Thanks a lot, everybody, and both of the, our secretaries look forward to hearing from you in the future. <laughs>